Bill Squadron, president of our, of our energy policy, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon on the problem of permitting. Um, we're going to move into it uh, right away because we've got a lot of ground to cover with some outstanding opening remarks and an excellent panel. Um, I do want to thank all of our partners who support our energy policies work in this space and particularly our co-host today, Distributed Sun. Um, I also would encourage all of you to use the questions tab uh, on the screen if you do have questions because at the latter part of the hour we will get to as many questions as we can from you. So uh, please be sure to do that. Um, I'm now going to introduce to deliver opening remarks Congressman Pete Stauber, Republican from, the, from Minnesota's 8th District and the Chairman of the House Energy and Mineral Resources Subcommittee, uh, a member of the House who is deeply knowledgeable and committed to American energy independence, and we are very grateful for his taking time to be with us today to deliver opening remarks on this critical subject. Congressman? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation today to discuss such a timely topic. And I'm pleased to participate in a panel with such a wide swath of the energy sector participating. As mentioned in the introduction, I have the privilege to serve as the chair of the Subcommittee on Energy and Minerals Resources, which has a direct role to play in permitting reform. <clears throat> of the three bills that passed through the House Natural Resources Committee in HR1, two of which passed through my subcommittee. Full committee chair Bruce Westerman included the TAP American Energy Act, which provides a host of permitting reforms. It strengthened lead agencies, codified the now rollback Trump era uh, CEQ regulations, updated withdrawal parameters, and streamlined regulations for siting transmission. We also moved my bill, the Permitting for Mining Needs Act, which provided a host of updates to our broken permitting process for mining in our nation and creates certainty for domestic producers and minerals. And the district I represent, Minnesota's eighth congressional district, has an even larger role to play in permitting reform and reducing emissions. And I understand there are folks from our great state of Minnesota on this uh, uh, podcast here today, and I wanna say welcome. You see, Minnesota's eighth alone has been producing iron, for over 145 years, and America won two world wars with resources from our district. Today, the Iron Range in Minnesota's northeastern section accounts for almost 80% of America's steel. Occurring alongside those iron deposits are the greatest untapped mineral resources in the world, the Duluth Complex and the Tamarack Intrusive Complex combined account. The combination of these two account for 95% of America's nickel reserve, almost 90% of America's cobalt reserve, 75% of America's platinum, and more than one third of our copper, right in this complex in Northeastern Minnesota called the Duluth Complex. Yes, Northern Minnesota alone has those resources, and we have yet to move, move Earth at all on those resources. In fact, we have one mining proposal on year 20 of permitting and litigation. Think about that, a proposal to mine the minerals needed for clean energy is being held up for 20 years. We have another project that 10 years in had its federal leases pulled and a withdrawal put in place on the federal land where mining is a desired condition in the forest plan. Again, my district is the cultural home of iron mining. We do it the best in the entire world. Yet, this administration abuses its authorities day in and day out to curb domestic mineral development and my district is the epicenter. The district I represent wants to help you get to where you want to be. We want to mine the minerals that go in our solar panels, that go in our wind turbines, and that go in our transmission lines. And HR1's benefit, benefits go much further. There is a transmission line crossing from Iowa to Wisconsin that is on year seven of permitting. 
The goal of that project is to put more wind energy on our grid. Cost and time overruns for any project that has to comply with federal uh, statutes are rampant. In short, there is no renewable energy future without permitting reform. And there is no renewable energy future without the minerals in my district. I thank you all for giving me this opportunity and have a wonderful discussion. Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and for laying the groundwork for the discussion that's going to ensue among our distinguished panel. Um, and we look forward to working with you and your office in the future. We're now going to turn this over to um, the panelists to discuss these issues in real detail. Um, and I'd ask all of them to turn their cameras on. Um, and as I introduce them, let me remind our audience again about questions if they have them, and also to, to take advantage of our energy policies, energy library online, which has all kinds of materials related to this subject and is the best curated repository of papers, reports, studies, and so forth on this topic um, anywhere online. So please take advantage of that. As you know, OEP is a nonpartisan organization committed to education and to bringing people together of diverse perspectives and views. And we thank our partners for supporting it. I'm now going to turn it over to our co-host from Distributed Sun, Jeff Weiss. He is the co-founder and executive director of Distributed Sun, which is a leading developer of US solar projects across 15 states at the community level, industrial level, utility scale level. Um, and Jeff uh, is going to moderate our panel today. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. And uh, please take it, please take it on. Um, thank you so much, Bill, and thank you, our energy policy, and thank you um, so much, Congressman, for your um, introductory remarks, which were um, uh, core and to everything uh, we're going to talk about. So I, we we really appreciate that. So we've got a fabulous group to uh, talk about permitting uh, for the next um, uh, better part of an hour. Um, so I'm joined by uh, Dr. Paul Pfeiffer, who's the Permitting and Development Director of Attentive Energy, which is running the New York Bright Offshore Wind Project. And Paul has tremendous experience uh, in some of the largest uh, offshore wind projects and what that means in terms of permitting, which we'll, which we'll get into. We're joined by Karen Hanley, Senior Vice President of the Permitting Institute. Um, uh, prior to joining the Permitting Institute two years ago, she was the country's top interagency permitting expert literally helping agencies and project directors alike navigate and align permitting processes and requirements to save time, eliminate risk, increase transparency, and preserve natural resources. Complicated and important stuff. Uh, thank you for joining us, Karen. Uh, and then the third is, of course, uh, Emily Wong. Emily is Director of Federal Relations at the American Petroleum Institute, uh, leading legislative and regulatory outreach um, for the association, also with deep outreach. Before I get into the first questions, let, let, let me mention to, to everybody, you know, we're having this conversation because we're at a moment of great generational change, right? The energy of tomorrow is upon us. The Congressman talked about that in part, but permitting transmission and litigation, permitting transmission and litigation are the key hard problems to advance our energy economy. And we're gonna talk about permitting today. With no change, business as usual, we cannot achieve energy national security. So this is not just a casual conversation. We must do the stuff that these folks are gonna talk about. It's really important. You know, in electricity grid alone today, uh, renewable is at 40%, uh, but with, uh, with vehicles electrified, it's gonna require doubling the grid. Transition takes decades. The final 20% of carbon abatement will be a very long tail. Oil and natural gas are key components of not only energy generation, but national security for the foreseeable future generations. Uh, the three bills that have been passed, some of which we're gonna talk about, the IRA, the BIF, the CHIPS Act, uh, appropriated in round numbers $2 trillion, that's a lot of money. By talking about permitting, we're actually talking about what's gonna cause them to be, them and others to be successful. Okay, in 2008 and nine, Congress passed the ARA Act, the, the, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act, 
90 billion dollars was appropriated then and only 27 and a half billion was ever spent so we only spent 30 percent of that money um, quite frankly we need to do better and permitting key to that oil and natural gas need this uh, to get uh, to be expedited to get projects moving permits interconnection transition many are rallying behind something we'll talk about which is the bipartisan aspen institute report uh, building cleaner faster but that requires legislation to implement um, so let's get into this. And Karen, um, I'm going to ask you uh, to lead um, in the first question. Uh, you've argued that um, rising tides lift all boats. It's a, it, it's a wonderful uh, metaphor. Um, and that we should seek strategic solutions. Please share the, if you would, and help, help us set the table for the permanent legislative landscape. Is there a grand bargain in the offing? And what issues regarding the permitting process fall uh, 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 into both federal, state, and local levels. Thank you, Karen. Sure, thank you. Uh, well, I think I would start by saying that large infrastructure projects, especially of the size and scale that we're seeing being funded uh, by the federal laws that you just mentioned in this once in a generation opportunity, as well as all of the additional private capital that is coming in, in addition to that, partially leveraged by that funding by the federal government, um, we are dealing with an incredibly complex permitting landscape that's influenced by an extraordinarily dynamic regulatory landscape uh, that is across federal, state, local levels, often uncoordinated. Um, and when we're talking about rising tides lift all boats, we're looking for good governance in the permitting process itself. A lot of the focus right now in the conversation is focused solely on NEPA which is only a portion of the permitting process, which can be actually up to 65 additional federal laws and regulations, reviews, authorizations, and that doesn't count the state and local ones. Um, and where policy comes into play, we consider that to be a separate discussion. The process itself should not be used subjectively to pick winners and losers, but that conversation happens in the policy sphere, on the Hill, through rulemakings, but the process, the permitting process should be pretty straightforward. You should be able to understand what is required in an application, when you can expect to have a complete application submitted, what agencies are going to have regulatory authority over your proposed project, timeframes for when all that's going to happen in the previous uh, opener mention of electricity transmission. We have several examples where NEPA only consists of less than half of the total federal permitting process. So you really have to look at it in a grand scale. There's been a number of efforts by Congress to direct that state and local regulatory offices and permits be incorporated into project permitting plans at the federal level, but we rarely see that occur. So that's something else where we have a number of forthcoming reforms that address on that, that partnership issue in terms of how do we align all of these disparate processes into a way that makes sense so you can have informed decision making. Fantastic, thank, thank you so much. So um, I mentioned in the um, opening remarks, the, um, the uh, paper called Building Cleaner Faster, which is the final report um, bipartisan from the Aspen Institute, um, which among other things um, calls for a combination of either immediate approvals of permits, accelerated approvals, um, accelerated adjudications, which goes to what Karen's talking about in terms of process, and state and local conformity. And the specifics under that um, would um, greatly accelerate um, the kinds of projects everyone is, is looking at, but um, um, I, I'd appreciate a, a, a conversation about it. So the, the um, uh, as I mentioned, this was previously done in the uh, at a certain level in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, and um, meaning permitting, a level of, per of change in permitting, and permitting is permanently done for oil and gas drilling on federal land. Um, so would you take a deal like this to expedite permitting across the board, uh, given that it's technology neutral, and what would you like uh, changed uh, to, uh, to implement this? And this is, this is for everybody. I'm happy to jump in, Jeff. I think yep. you phrased that well. And first off, thanks. And thanks to our energy policy posting. Um, it is a deal, right? I mean, it's it's a bold vision to 
set a layer over um, those 65 laws that Karen mentioned, right? And, and to sort of say, we're gonna have geographic areas or particular technologies that'll either have immediate approval because of their uh, benefit to climate or they'll have expedited review, expedited adjudications. You know, on, on one hand, that that's the obvious choice. And maybe this is an issue that uh, you have enough consternation across all political stripes that uh, the action is is needed. You know, we'd heard from the congressman concern uh, about his district. Uh, I think you'd have, uh, you know, you can see the the conflict that might arise there, given the area and the natural resources there. That conflict between mining and and uh, the need for those minerals and also the, the local opposition. Um, so, but it's all just a matter of trade-offs, right? I mean, all permitting to me is an expression of our values. So it's an expression of risk management. And I think that that kind of expression from a congressional standpoint might be the best avenue, right? You're getting sort of the legislative body in the US to weigh in and say, here's how we're gonna express our values and our permits in a very structured, clear way. I think there's something else we can get to is if change is going to come, it needs to be structured. It needs to be clear. It just can't, it can't be aspirational. Um, and so Congress sort of weighing in and setting clear markers like that, if that is a feasible avenue right now, I think it would be the, the clearest and, and boldest stroke. And given what the UN just said this week about us approaching the tipping point, I think you get a lot of scientists saying we need bold action now. Emily, what is um, American Petroleum Institute's point of view? So I appreciate you bringing up this issue of tech neutrality, Jeff. Um, I think that's something that's really important to us when talking about permitting reform. Um, we feel very strongly that any of those discussions need to be holistic um, and that policymakers need to stay away from trying to pick winners and losers when it comes to the types of projects that will benefit from those reforms. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas out there right now that should be a part of those discussions, including this report. Um, I think the report's a good example of the fact that folks from all different industries and perspectives um, often identify the same issues when it comes to permitting and what needs to change. Um, and for us, I think the big things that stand out are this constant call for greater clarity, more consistency um, in how applications are evaluated and more predictability in the process. Fantastic. Um, and I imagine from a, from a tech neutrality point of view, there's, there's, um, um, there's just a broad uh, aperture um, in the, uh, in the uh, natural gas and the energy and the, in the oil and gas uh, space. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly um, thinking about the future and considering things like hydrogen and carbon capture and CO2 pipelines and all of those things are um, projects that would benefit from uh, the same types of permitting reforms that we look for on the more traditional oil and gas side of things. Right. Thank you so much. Um, Karen, what is the uh, Permitting Institute's uh, perspective? Sure. So I think um, focusing in on uh, potential exclusions from permitting for projects with no environmental impact, um, you know, we've seen a lot of conversation around the use of categorical exclusions, whether that can be interused by different agencies, um, you know, what the statutory language is in terms of that use by multiple agencies of a categorical exclusion that's been identified versus what is happening in the rulemaking space by agencies for agency specific categorical exclusions, um, where there is no environmental impact to determine that there's no environmental impact, there usually still has to be some look at what the proposal is to make sure there isn't some exception. Uh, one of the examples I've seen at the Coast Guard is in order to in implement and execute a categorical exclusion, there's a half page checklist that just goes through what would those exceptions be to make sure someone looked at those and that helps protect the project as well as the agency to make sure that they did that extra check for appropriate use of a categorical exclusion. But there's certainly a lot of opportunity there to take a look at how agencies are identifying and pursuing rulemakings for categorical exclusions and then ensure their appropriate use. Thanks, and I think underscoring or what what each of you all said is, you know, the the, the change needs to happen by uh, expediting permitting, right? So there there are siding and permitting challenges across technologies, across the country, across everything, 
Um, and on the one hand, we've passed um, a bunch of laws and have a bunch of expectations of what's going to happen, but you, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. Uh, so we need permits uh, to, allow, to allow that to happen. Um, and of course, uh, you know, going back to what the Congressman said, there are tremendous supply chain constraints, and, and a lot of that's uh, based on what comes in America, what's made in America, uh, which is about yeah. energy dependence. Jeff, I could just, just add one element here, it's just to the conversation is the, um, the human aspect of this and how, how an action like that from Congress, it, it could be bold and set the tone, right? If, if, if we really need a global change and if we do need a, a, an energy transition with a scope of all technologies available and how do we reasonably use all technologies as we move forward, as Emily said, um, how do we, is just sort of refining that panoply of laws sufficient? Or is that bold sort of stroke to say, we're gonna actually take a, a whole new approach and couple with the existing laws? So I don't think, I don't see that Aspen report proposing to eliminate any laws, but rather just sort of streamline and be very clear from a congressional standpoint, how those laws will be implemented. That's the kind of thing that sets the tone that I would say that filters down to through the federal agencies, even to the states as opposed to tweaking and, and making minor regulatory revisions across those 65 uh, laws that, that Karen mentioned. Thanks, so, so Paul, I'm gonna ask you to go on a little bit and talk about the barriers in state and federal levels uh, regarding construction of renewable energy projects since you're in the renewable space and connecting them to the grid. Uh, in our conversation, you said you're a fan of the Ezra Klein podcast about when the uh, Green Deal meets old green laws. Um, you probably, I can't imagine what you're doing. You, you must have the largest permitting challenge imaginable, right? You're, you're working in federal waters, right? Gala, you have to address fish, you have to address water, tourism, the Navy, NIMBY, and, and you probably got a longer list than I just, uh, than I just listed. Uh, among your permitting constraints, um, which is, and, and I'd like you to address, and the Congressman kind of alluded to this, is the legal infrastructure. So offshore oil and gas have an easier time than offshore wind because their lawsuits go straight to circuit courts, while wind must first go through district courts, and that's based on a law. Do you think wind should get the same expedited legal treatment as oil and gas? I think that's definitely something that needs to be uh, investigated, right? It's uh, there's, a, there's a host of issues there. One is it, since it's happened with oil and gas, how has that worked? What are the trade-offs there? Uh, clearly, you're trading off potentially some public interest or pub some public engagement for something else. If that's true, is that has that worked? Do we still understand the risks associated with offshore wind such that we want to make that trade-off such that the benefit is worth it? Um, yes, and I, I think offshore wind is particularly vulnerable because it is so new, right? And I, I spent 20 years with the federal government much of that implementing the Endangered Species Act. And you know it's 50 years old and we're still trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, so offshore wind as the new kid on the block is getting all the attention because there's so many, the pieces had never been discussed before. We really hadn't managed what birds are flying 50 miles offshore at you know, 100 meters above the seafloor. Now we suddenly have to think about that. So it's, it's getting a lot of attention just because of the novelty of it. And so how do we take those lessons from something that had come before us, oil and gas, uh, and say. I can't hear you. Yeah, well, Paul's reconnecting. I worked with him uh, a bit while I was within the federal government as well uh, on offshore wind projects. And, um, you know, I would, I would make the point, too, that we're seeing a lot of new changes in terms of the leasing process as well, where there is now a lot of conditions um, to be eligible for bidding and part of the leasing process in terms of um, environmental justice and emissions and community engagement. So you're seeing a massive change at what is happening at what stage of the permitting process and what's expected. And that is continuing to evolve and developers are having to adjust to that on a real time basis. But you're not really seeing that to the same extent for other other types of infrastructure and other programs in the country. Um, and so taking a step back and looking at what enhances the environmental community outcomes for these projects, but also how do we incorporate that at the correct point in the process as part of the formal 
part of the process where the engagement can happen and it's not like a mini NEPA happening before NEPA actually begins and is initiated, I think is, is part of the conversation. Looks like. Um, Emily, let's talk about the oil and gas sector. Uh, 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 for next, please. So uh, talk to us, please, about the major challenges you have involving the permitting process and, and how to address, address them. I mean, certainly um, uh, permitting laws have restricted new pipelines. And I know more generally that in the oil and gas sector this is especially important for gas, which many are talking about as the forever natural gas, which people are talking about as the forever fuel. Um, and it, it has multiple layers of technology, which perhaps you can talk about in terms of how it's used and, 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 and how it's used in terms of LNG uh, export. Um, and then, um, so if you, if you would go ahead and share some thoughts with us, thank you. Sure, thanks for the question. I think this kind of alludes to a common misconception that um, the oil and gas industry is looking for some sort of special carve out or shortcut on environmental reviews when we talk about the need for permitting reform. Um, but that really isn't the case. Um, I think, you know, we recognize the importance of doing our due diligence when it comes to infrastructure projects. And the things that we're looking for, um, from our perspective, would be common across all industries. Um, not to sound like a broken record, I know this has come up several times already, but I think for us, the most important elements of a permitting deal would be greater clarity about what's expected from project proponents, um, more consistency in how those applications are evaluated, and more predictability in terms of timelines. And I think, you know, it's our view that the more clarity there is about um, what agencies want to see from project proponents, um, and the more consistency there is in the application evaluation process, that leads to more judicially durable um, project decisions. Um, and so we think, you know, that also provides benefits when it comes to this problem um, of projects that are approved then being tied up in litigation for an additional number of years um, after whatever time's already been invested on the front end getting through the agency approval process. Um, you know, so for us, I think our focus right now really is trying to build momentum um, on how permitting reform can benefit all industries and not just ours. Um, good. So are there trades you'd be willing to make to achieve um, more pipeline or other certainty that you're seeking? Um, what common ground would you support to achieve a permitting deal in Congress? Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope that we could find common ground on sort of the things that I just touched on. Um, and, and I think, you know, another big part of what we mean when we talk about consistency is just right now, the way the permitting process works, I think, you know, every four to eight years, depending on who's in charge in the White House, um, we might see the goalposts move in terms of what's expected um, when you talk about how to move a project across the finish line. And so I think we just want to see the permitting process get to a place where, you um, those goalposts aren't gonna move every time there's a change in the political headwinds. Um, that's the kind of consistency that I think that um, our members and we at API are really looking for. I think we've got a lot of agreement across um, technologies and asset classes. Um, let's go to a, a, a different one. The Congressman is not on the call, but, but, he, but he let us off by talking about among other things, mining. And he suggests that the um, Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and the CHIPS Act don't go far enough to ensure uh, American energy security. So he's uh, apparently he's written the Mining Needs Act, uh, which suggests assuring critical middle, assuring the supply of critical minerals needed for growth in energy technologies are sourced in the United States. So as part of American um, energy security, uh, we need large quantities of minerals. Um, and it's important for them to be sourced in the United States for our, for our energy security. Uh, do you agree that they, then the group could, could talk for, on his behalf for a moment uh, that the current decades long process to get domestic critical minds up and running should be fixed? Hey Jeff, this is Paul, can you hear me now? We, yes, we can. Yay. I figured it has to happen sometime in my career where my internet drops right in the middle of me talking. Um, you know, on that, I think that's just a great example of the, the scale at which we need to understand these risks, right? So you mentioned cobalt, for example, and I think from what I understand, the majority of cobalt we use in our 
renewable energy comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, I don't know what their regulations are, or how they're, it's mined over there, but it would be ideal if we could not just leave these solely to market forces, but rather if we as a, a permitting country, in, in permitting within our country could say, we understand this is a resource we need and what's the value of a domestic production? Knowing that anything we do, any energy production, any trans energy transportation will have an impact. But how do we assess that impact from the large scale to the small scale? Uh, the large scale being what, what is that trade-off of cobalt being produced globally and um, imported here versus produced locally, but having potential local impacts? So how do we make those assessments and that trade-off? And as Karen said, that's often, in, you know, that's filtered through those 65 individual laws, often NEPA being a majority one. I just think we could do a better job of articulating those, those trade-offs and really understanding that with a bias towards action, right? With a bias towards if we really sort of feel like the UN tipping point language is, is should be a guiding principle with a bias towards um, understanding what maybe some small scale risks are gonna be needed so that we have long-term benefits. Yeah, I think Paul really said it in terms of, you know, we, I think are coming to have a new appreciation in terms of policy, just writ large on global impacts. And we have an opportunity to be a leader recognizing this, this huge demand for critical minerals to be a leader in identifying a way to obtain those resources in a responsible way. Um, and it becomes a balance of trade-offs, which I think is also another point Paul made. We tend to agree on many things. <laughs> and so where, where you have where the critical minerals are located in large enough quantities for it to make sense for a mining operation and trade-offs on where we have very significant environmental and cultural resources or impacts to local communities in that area or recreation or fishing or, you know, we have a lot of special places in our country that may be where a lot of these critical minerals are also located. So how to manage that? I think that can certainly be done in less time than it's currently taking. It just takes leadership where leadership is currently lacking in terms of what we need as a country and what our objectives are and how we're gonna go about handling and managing those trade-offs and making informed decisions. And that gets to something, that idea about uh, clarity of expectations, right? I think when the, the recent NEPA regulations didn't say we wanna just do NEPA EISs, environmental impact statements faster and shorter. They said we want to do them, the majority of them should be done in two years and no more than 350 pages. That kind of clarity was very helpful. Uh, and that kind of clarity is filtered through a lot of other laws, but I think that is, there's more of that. So if we talk about congressional action, there's also obviously regulatory action, action by the executive branch. And I think there's two things I would put in that bucket. One is that regulatory clarity uh, with that clear expectations articulated so that you have accountability. So folks know when they start an environmental impact statement that we, the industry know that essentially should just take no more than two years for the most part. Um, so that's one. And the other one is managerial involvement. And we could talk about that more, but I think that that effort for regulatory clarity and accountability is, is really important. It gets the clarity that Emily was mentioning. Well, thanks. Let's let's keep going down this path because I think it's very productive. So you know, you, you just mentioned um, you know the two year the, the two year cap and, and and perhaps a summary is two is the two is the new ten. So let's use two as the new ten as our theme. So anything that takes ten years, the metaphor is anything that takes ten years, seven, eight, twelve, whatever, is just too long, right? It literally is irrelevant if it takes that long. So the constraint is how do we get things to happen in two or three? instead of 10. So two, two is the new 10. And we got a lot of process, the plural we, federal, state, local, regulatory, law. We, we just have so many constraints, which is why we're talking about permitting, that you know one starts with a good idea and the right technology and the capital's lined up and golly, it just takes 10 years. So it's sort of the proverbial death by a thousand cuts. So the Biden, Biden administration has made climate action and energy transition a top priority. Right, that's their, that's a top priority. What 
what should we be advising them to do regarding energy permitting at the federal level to make two of the new, new 10? I can, I can weigh in on that, Jeff. That's, a, that's an interesting phrasing of the question, right? Um, I think there are things they can do, much like we talked about the, the Aspen, Aspen, Aspen Institute talked about for congressional action. So they could executively say how things, uh, they could look at things more programmatically and sort of uh, clear the path for some projects that may be, uh, Want to, don't want to say lower risk, but sort of net positive, right, from the key uh, issues of concern, whether it be habitat or uh, climate change, clear the path. And, 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 you know, shout out to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. They're trying to do that with the new six uh, lease areas off the course of the New York Bight. They're trying to take a programmatic look. Now, we all know that something like a programmatic uh, EIS could be one of those things that takes six years, but it's not, right? They're going to stay to two years and, and the devil's in the details, but that kind of effort to say, okay, we know these swaths of activities are needed. We're gonna now initiate initial reviews starting uh, and then clear the path for those follow-on projects. Great ideas, thank you so much. Um, Emily, does API have um, kind of regulatory and, and suggestions to uh, help make two of the new 10 for you guys? I mean, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I think, you know, I'll reiterate what I said earlier, which is, uh, I think part of the reason that we have these extended timeframes from our perspective is that often you don't know what it takes to get your application to complete. Um, there's a lot of back and forth with the agency um, when the project proponent doesn't get them the information that they want because they didn't know that it was necessary. Um, and so I think if there is um, clearer guidance on the front end in terms of what is expected and we have a little more transparency in how the process is going to work, um, that really opens up the opportunity for more efficiency, both um, for the person that's assembling the application and for the person that's reviewing it. Um, so we, we really think that those core fixes um, should lead to shorter time frames inherently. Um, once we we're looking at less ambiguity in terms of um, what it takes to be successful in the permitting process, um, that's going to be like the, the biggest fix, I think, that will result in shorter time frames. I would just say picking up on the, the time frames, you know, the fast 41 process, which Karen's very familiar, right? The, the dashboard, the, the process where big infrastructure projects can get on that dashboard that provides clarity to the public. About timelines, I think that's a very beneficial step. And I think it's still, there's still a lot of opportunity for the Fast 41 process to be even used more. Karen, any thoughts on that? Oh, many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, many. Uh, you know, <laughs> I would here. say, you know, like step one is to get the process out of the black box. There's no reason that anyone, agencies included, shouldn't know how many projects and what projects and where are undergoing EISs or reviews in general, or are in backlog in terms of their application waiting due to priority policies, or where, um, where you are in the process, are you paused and you don't know it? Does, does a public community member know when their opportunity for public comment is going to be? I don't know about the other Panelists, I know I don't read the Federal Register every day with my coffee. I just that's not that's not my thing. Um, and so I think making these things accessible as they always should have been. We have the technology now. The platform exists with the permitting dashboard. Uh, Paul mentioned Fast 41, but right now there's less than two dozen projects that actually are going through that process and have access to those tools as, as currently covered projects. Um, I would say that, you know, having reasonable timeframes for all federal government reviews as a whole for the project as a whole, not just NEPA, but for everything else is critical because two years for NEPA, but still having 10 years with everything else included still doesn't achieve the goal. Um, and that is already a provision that is required per FAST 41, where agencies have been directed to develop what are called recommended performance schedules which is sector specific 
and is designed to start with um, the two year time frame, but also include data based time frames in terms of how long historically have they taken, how much faster can we do it if we utilize all the best practices agencies have been identifying for the past six years under that program in terms of alignment, as well as ensuring that you have meaningful community engagement, government to government tribal consultations, how do we improve that process, how do we use tools and technologies to make clear what the process actually consists of, to Emily's point in terms of what do I need to get to a complete application. So I think just getting things out of the black box is the fundamental because from there, agencies can now identify, they don't even have the tools to do it. They can now identify what their resource needs are, what their staffing resource needs are, how to manage their workforce across the country differently if they are a decentralized agency. And currently projects are backlogged just because I don't have an archeologist that's available in this specific local office, but there's one available in another one. So I think it's just a matter of the whole the whole process needs to be managed in this fundamental way that happens so many other spaces in the country <laughs> if you're going to send up a rocket there's generally a schedule and everyone's operating off of that even though you have the team that's spread across the country so i think it's just going back to these fundamentals incorporating the accountability the enforcement of existing reforms there's a lot of things that have already been done by congress that um, are not complied with, and you know there's there's a number of mechanisms that are available um, to look at to to help embrace enforcement aspect of things that have already been done and are ongoing, and make sure more projects are able to avail themselves of that. So, so thank you. I just want to mention to the audience, like I can keep asking questions for a very long time because this is fascinating and a lot of fun, but I'm not seeing questions in the chat. Um, perhaps our energy policy has other questions. I'd, I'd be happy to uh, uh, get to them as soon as um, as they're uh, offered. Um, um, if, 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 if there are um, if there are other questions. Um, well, Jeff, we actually have been receiving questions this entire time, and this seems like a good time to jump in with them. Um, okay, so the first audience Q and A. <laughs> Um, for renewable energy projects, what are the most important, you know, two or three things that developers can do to make the permitting process as painless and efficient as possible? What can developers do? I think it's, I don't know if there's anything unique to renewable energy. Maybe the one thing is, as I mentioned, we're still dealing with some federal and state agencies that don't really understand our, our business. And so there is a bit of educational aspect here where we, what does it really mean to do at sea surveys? Uh, what does that really involve? What, how tall are these turbines going to be? I remember talking to one federal uh, civil servant, and he was asking, "Well, your your turbine is going to be what two, three hundred feet tall?" And I said, "No, no, they're going to be a thousand feet tall." And just so that level of scale is, you know, people just haven't encountered it. So that's level of familiarity that we can we can work with. Um, we are trying to engage often and engage early right? Not only just the federal agencies, but the state agencies, the public, to make them understand what this, the future of this industry looks like. And um, renewable energy is interesting because it's not, especially something like offshore wind, it's not just a matter of producing renewable electrons, but we're also developing a supply chain. So we have to develop a workforce. Uh, we have to train them. We have to, we're going to create a lot of new jobs. So that, that's telling that whole story is interesting not just from a public relations perspective or from a public benefit perspective, but also permitting. So when a permitter asks us, hey, we, we're concerned about this benthic habitat. We want you to remove this turbine. Do they fully understand that that turbine, you know, produces 20, $30 million to the local economy, employs X number of people over 20 years, just that one turbine alone to produce and maintain? Is that part of that uh, factor into their trade-off analysis when they're doing their NEPA. That's the kind of thing where I think we need to do a better job as a renewable energy company telling the full story. Thank you. So um, um, I'm now seeing the uh, questions that are posed, so I can uh, go ahead and ask some of them from, from, the, uh, from the participants. Um, Jeff, so, uh, actually, I'll, I'll take care of them. We've been kind of collecting them as we go along. Um, so the second one we have listed is, um, is there a way to meaningfully reduce pipeline permitting and litigation timelines without changing NEPA? And it's something 
if that's not something you've been addressing, but if you could speak further to that. Um, so I think I'll echo something that Karen mentioned at the beginning of our, our conversation, which is that there's sort of separate issues when it comes to talking about permitting reform, when it comes to policy versus the process. Um, and so I just wanna reiterate something that I mentioned earlier, um, which is that we're not looking to, to change NEPA in terms of saying that um, environmental considerations don't matter when it comes to permitting pipeline projects. Um, what we're looking for ideally are changes um, on the process side of things. Um, and so I, I think there's a way to fix the permitting process that still preserves those important environmental interests that NEPA was designed to protect, um, but also allows us to get infrastructure built um, in, in a reasonable time frame. I would point to um, the example of Alaska LNG, which was published in um, the Federal Permanent Improvement Steering Council's annual report to Congress when that received all of its um, approvals from the federal government. Uh, I think that's an example of an extremely large and complex project where process management, um, engagement by management, um, a really top-notch developer that you know always came came ready and prepared and really um, understood how to support uh, the project management and, and, and help coordinate everything that was needing to happen amongst the agencies and was very you know meticulous about keeping track of those action items and any delays along the way rather than waiting for the big milestones to slip. Um, but I think that project, and, and that's up on the permitting dashboard as a project, if anyone wants to go and look, uh, it's at permits.performance.gov. You can go to projects and look at Alaska LNG as just an example, where there were no changes to NEPA, there were no changes to any underlying environmental protection or law or other environmental review or authorization. That was really the function of um, program management, project management, and really getting, again, I, I keep saying it, but just getting the project out of the black box and out into the open where issues could be proactively addressed and delays could be addressed and best practices could be implemented and um, any, any issues in those actions that everyone agreed to in terms of implementation could be immediately elevated and addressed. All right, thank you. Um, what would you say about um, how we can establish clear project parameters that developers must meet on environmental mitigation, mitigation of community impacts, et cetera. I know you talked about this a little bit, but if you could just expand on what parameters you would think would help make the process more clear. Within that congressional framework, I think the Aspen Institute outlines some of that, right? You do sort of, you clear the path for things that you, certain projects, certain geographies um, that you think have all some net benefit. You can uh, do programmatic agreements. Uh, the government can be more proactive and sort of setting out proactive uh, expectations. I, when I used to manage the Endangered Species Act, I always told my team, look, it shouldn't be used as a tool to tell people what not to do, but it should be used as a tool to incentivize the behavior we want. So be clear about what success looks like from an offshore wind project, for example, that uh, here's the type of habitat we think you should avoid. If you do have to intersect with this habitat, here are the mitigation measures you should implement. And as long as then we have followed that template, uh, we should have a streamlined review. And I will say that's what BOEM is trying to do with their programmatic uh, environmental impact statement. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, next, uh, what kind of deal on permitting do you think could make it through this split Congress and how likely do you think action is this year? Sure. Well, I think there's interest on both sides of the aisle, um, in particular in long linear projects. Uh, I think there's a recognition that um, where our energy needs in particular are, where the needs are, isn't necessarily the same place as where the, the source is or the generation can be. Um, and there's a lot of complexities in there where communities are impacted by projects that they may not necessarily be directly benefiting from and jurisdictional issues and questions about eminent domain and, and all sorts of things there. Um, 
in that complexity, though, I think there is common ground to look at just how do we deal with our interests as a country in a clear and transparent and predictable way and just where things haven't been working for a long time that have just come to a critical point where now they do just need to be dealt with or, or neither type of project is going to be going through in the time frame and scale that that we need it to so i think we're going to continue to see um re-examinations by folks on the hill of what has been proposed for reform over the past <laughs> two decades i keep seeing the same things coming up over and over again and maybe um you know being more willing to compromise on the extremes of those packages that have been proposed over and over again and instead focus on again what definition of success looks like um, a dispute resolution process shouldn't be nearly a year long that's not going to be helpful um, but also where where are these fundamental process corrections that don't eliminate the intended objectives of environmental protections that can help these projects move forward. So I do think there's an opportunity here that is very timely. Um, and it's just, I think, taking a fresh look at what has been proposed year over year over year and re-examining like, if these things pass, will these projects move forward or are there recurring systemic issues that these projects have still not actually being addressed by the same set of reform proposals? Really? Also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say, I think the fact that the, the success of the IIJA and the IRA and getting that funding out the door um, and translating it into meaningful projects sort of depends, right, on the success of a permitting reform movement in Congress. And so I think um, that's really something that we're going to see help build momentum to move something across the finish line. Um, obviously, all industries have their own little pet asks that they would like to see included in a package like that. Um, but I think it's been pretty clear from our discussion today um, that we've all identified a lot of the same big picture issues. Um, and you know, it's certainly our hope um, at API at least that there's enough agreement there um, for us to see something move across the finish line. You know, one thing just that, that we haven't talked about a bit, and I know there's always the staffing questions for the agencies, I won't necessarily get into that, but, you know, if there's almost 3 million federal employees and say they make 10 important decisions a day, that's what, 150 million decisions a week that the federal government's making that may or may not get ourselves towards the outcomes we want. And so the, I would say the role of strong management and clear management and clear expectations, not filtered down from presidential aspirations of say 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, but sort of downscaling that to the individual civil servant who's making decisions uh, and making sure that that all aligns up, no matter how good our funding is or how uh, clear some of our expectations are, it has to be filtered down to the actual people doing the work. Uh, and so to help them help those big risks and big pictures be downscaled to individual decisions. You know, does this, does this might have, there's a trade-off here. Everything has a trade-off. Is the trade-off for the small scale temporary impacts worth the long scale benefits that we say are urgently needed? To, to, underscore, to underscore Paul's point, the IRA legislation in particular uh, earmarks $350 million for people to do permitting in the government. $350 million, a lot of it's in your pocket. Um, assume that 250 goes to the states and 100 to federal. It's allocated on, or earmarked over 10 years. That's 25 million a year divided by 50 states, divided by five agencies each. That's $100,000 each. So by the time you get down to it, you then talk about staffing and, 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 and the application of it um, and, and the implementation. There are really important questions. Yeah. And that's where it all really happens. That's where most of the, you know, that's. That's the bulk of the decisions that are made out there is at those levels. All right, thank you all. Um, can you comment on how the push for considering cumulative impacts versus just direct impacts will impact the pace of permitting? Well, I, the pace is 
I mean, it, cumulative impact, impacts is always some, uh, you know, predictive effort done by smart folks. And I think it's helpful here from a if perspective, if we're trying to figure out what's a reasonable energy transition and, and how do we bring all technologies on board is to, to put everything into the factor, not just sort of the um, short-term effects, but the long-term uh, costs of a transition too fast or a transition too slow uh, or importing something from far away that has impacts versus producing it locally, mining it locally. That to me is a true cumulative effects analysis, which is rarely done. And so, they, but if I were a decision maker doing the NEPA, right, that's the kind of analysis that might be helpful to, to see the long-term benefits of a renewable energy project, for example, versus the short-term effects of uh, the construction of the project. And I will say that is where more and more NEPA related to wind is going, but I think there's still uh, room to grow. Yeah, to add to that, I would also say there's um, struggles by agencies on how to deal with restoration projects as well, whether that's the whole purpose of the proposed project is restoration of some sort, or whether that's part of a proposed project in terms of how they're going to avoid or minimize or mitigate some impact to environmental resources, how agencies treat a baseline. So, for example, if you're looking at uh, sediment diversion in the Gulf, where you're looking at, at marsh creation through a natural process, but you've already lost so much land. So now you have a coastal ecosystem existing where it shouldn't. This gets particularly tricky with wetlands because wetlands are under a high level of protection where um, there's a whole lot of things that come into play if you're gonna be impacting wetlands. But if that's not where wetlands are supposed to exist and some other ecosystem is supposed to exist there, agencies, often really struggle with how to deal with these beneficial projects, which again can be a standalone project or just even a portion of a different type of project and how they're dealing with their, their total impact. So I think that's something else where Congress has an opportunity to, to provide some clarity where um, I've seen extensive delays as agencies struggle with that question. Now, I hate to jump in here because this has been fascinating and, and incredibly insightful conversation and we could go on for quite a while but unfortunately we're at the end of our hour and um we need to wrap up i want to thank all of you i, I think uh we may have coined a new term the two is the new ten um but i also want to really underscore kind of the points that um karen paul and emily all made about having to look at this as overall holistic project management and really understanding that this is such a critical part of it and also uh, reflect on the fact that all of you were somewhat optimistic about getting something um, done on Capitol Hill, which in the wake of the IRA, I think seems um, perhaps to have more momentum. So thank you very much for all of your thoughts and insights. Thank you, Jeff, for moderating. Our thanks to all of our partners for supporting OEP and particularly to our co-host today, Distributed Sun. Um, thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us. And again, I want to encourage you to use the Our Energy Library that is on our website, which has um, a range of papers, articles, reports, and so forth on this and every other energy-related subject to help you with your work. So thanks again, Pete. Please be on the lookout for our next um, webinar coming up in April on the subject of critical minerals. And we wish you all a great day and a great rest of the week. Thanks again to all of you.